There we go. You should be able there to hear go. me now. I can hear you. You're good. Hey, good to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Thanks for having me on. You bet. You bet. Hey, I've been um, uh, uh, going through whatever I could find online, but um, um, give me a, a, a few talking points that you'd like to uh, to focus on before we uh, we go live here. I don't have any that I'd like to focus on. I'm happy to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. Oh, okay. Okay. And um, <laughs> um, well, let, let's see. How, how is your how is your schedule? I usually do about 45 minutes. Does that sound about right? Fine. Okay. Yeah. Well, let, well, let me, uh, um, you know, a lot of times I end up having a conversation with people that should have been recorded. So why don't we just start recording and then we will go from there. So let me, uh, let me make sure that we're in good shape for there and then uh, uh, go from there. This meeting is being recorded. Hey, welcome back to the Financial Advisor Marketing uh, Podcast or video meeting, however you're tuning in today. Uh, Dan, uh, this is the first time we're meeting, but um, um, I've been researching you and paying attention to your stuff and one thing or another and have, have been very impressed. In fact, uh, I, I, I know that you've actually written more books than I have, so I, uh, you, you've been quite prolific. I think I'm up to eight, and what are you at, 10 or? or... No, I've only beat you by one, and that oh. one just came out last month, so I'd say it's a tie so far. Okay, okay. The, uh, uh, the one that I was uh, spending more time looking at, I just ordered it. I haven't, uh, I haven't had a chance to read it yet. And, and by the way, remind me, I'll send you uh, my latest one on financial Great. advisor uh, marketing as well. <clears throat> uh, but that the book Ask uh, about about sales training, and um, I really like the. Uh, um, uh, in fact, let me let, let me read your words back off to you because this is what I've told people about selling for for probably forty years now. And then uh, I, I tuned and honed it a little bit from uh, Robert Cialdini's work, uh, Influence, Science, and Practice. You know, one of his yeah, wonderful one, book. One of his principles is, you know, people like you to the extent that they that they think that you like them, or that and the only you've it's got to be congruent and sincere. Um, but your line was that I really resonated with is when we empower others to talk about themselves, the brain activity in those people is similar to when they're engaged in their most pleasurable activity. Talking about yourself releases certain hormones that make you feel good. Doing so causes you to project traits of likability, trustworthiness onto the person who encourages you to talk. Now, I, I, I've said that in a slightly different way, which is people perceive you to be a great conversationalist to the extent that you ask short questions, listen to the answer, engage in them talking about themselves and their background. I could go through an hour conversation and ask five questions they do all the talking, and they think I'm a wonderful, engaged human being who who's really interested in them. Uh, but b before we go into that, let's let's go through your background a little bit. You, um, um, uh, why don't I let you you explain? You're you're down at what's a little south of Fort Myer on the uh, on the Gold Coast in Florida. Nice place to be. I'm at 8,000 foot elevation in Evergreen, Colorado, getting ready to get hit by a thunderstorm. So right. we have a little bit of a contrast. Um, uh, I'm in, envious. You're probably envious of my weather right about now, and I'll be envious of yours in uh, in a few months. But uh, tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into the financial advisor world, and how uh, talk talk about that a little bit, and then let's go from there. So I started my career as a lawyer, and I started working with a large Wall Street law firm, and eventually ended up with my own law firm in New York City. And towards the I was an international litigator. A lot of emphasis on international law and antitrust. But towards the end of my stint as a lawyer, which was about 35 years, I started representing investors who'd been harmed by the misconduct of their brokers. I knew very little about finance and investing. Mm -hmm. And um, so as I thought about what I was going to do with the rest of my life, I thought maybe it would be good to stop people from making these mistakes in the first place. So I think I'll become a financial advisor. So I did that for a while. Uh, and then I thought, what if I wrote a book about how to protect yourself from the financial industry, from that part of the financial industry that has a, as a business model transferring your wealth to them? And uh, not only to everybody else's amazement, but to my amazement, the book was a big seller. And... Um, that started my writing career, and nine books later, here I am. Excellent, excellent. Uh, as a litigator against the the financial industry and the brokers and so forth, 
what were some commonalities of ways that people were getting bilked out of their money? What what yeah. were what were some of the things that you were identifying? Well, some of first of all, some of the most surprising things to me, because I didn't know much either, to tell you the truth, that the, when I started, but is, is how little the brokers I was cross-examining about investing. They were they were salespeople. They were selling the highest commission products they could sell without regard to the risk tolerance of the people in front of them. So the, the whole business model was set up to transfer wealth. And people understood the risk that they were taking. And when the market turned down, they were, they were devastated by losses. And then they were panicked into selling, thereby creating realized from unrealized losses. So it was just a quagmire of, I don't know what to call it, inequity, iniquity. I mean, it was terrible to, to see people lose their life savings to people they, they entrusted with. Money. It was just a horrible thing. You bet. You bet. And the um, um, so it sounds like the, the the commonality oftentimes was was basically in the uh, the problem people selling to make money is more appropriate to find. And in it, uh, it tells a little bit why a good community is going to be a way to make money format um, in order to support the uh, client. The other book I read is Dr. Maya's book. That's not my idea. Written in the 20s, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. A guy named Schwed, I believe. There you go. There yeah. you go. I'm, I'm surprised I pulled out other resources of, of of, of my memory, yeah. But, uh, uh, it sounds like it in the in there. What, what transition for you, Larry, being an advisor? Uh, it, you know, it really isn't an unusual transition. I, you know, I have some friends in the business that are are basically in the business of teaching lawyers how to be financial advisors and showing them that they should be on that side of the business as well. But how did you end up making that transition? What a difficult transition was the process? It, it wasn't easy because, frankly, I'm not that great at math. I mean, it really, like passing the Series 65 exam was not a, a cakewalk for me. Mm -hmm. um, however, I've always been good at partnering with people who are a lot smarter than I am. So my partner, when we formed our first firm, was a PhD in finance and an assistant professor of finance at Wake Forest teaching MBA students finance. Mm -hmm. So he handled a lot of the technical aspects. I was always better at sales and marketing. Yeah. So he eased that transition for me greatly. Good, good, good. And, and, and where, where were your uh, uh, new clients coming from at that stage? Really all over because I had written a book uh, okay. at that point. I was getting a lot of calls from readers of my book who bought into what I was saying in the book, which is basically buy three index funds from from Vanguard, you'll be fine. But you know, people with larger assets needed more sophisticated portfolio management. We were in a position to provide that. So they were really, it was it was really before Zoom. If I had Zoom, we would have done 10 times as well, I think. We had to travel all around to meet clients, but um, it was still fairly easy to attract clients once the book got some traction. Yeah, it's, a, it, it, it's an underrated, I think, uh, benefit of the explosion of the Internet. Is video conferencing really has, has yes. changed the game, hasn't it? Changed and, everything. Yeah. And, and it, it doesn't replace face to face. You're in the same room, building relationship, but it, it's a close second. You know, it's it's much better than on, on the telephone. And in any direct interaction with somebody is is light years ahead of, of I guess a word that is still in use. Non can email messaging, you know, email, 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 email. So that misses the nuance. And that's, a, I think, a mistake that uh, advisors make. And uh, as I pick up from uh, uh, from the tone of your book, is 
see, to me, what gets missing on on Zoom is we don't have the coffee break. We don't, you know, grab lunch. We're not having the informal. And oftentimes people end up with being too busy making their pitch that they're not bit, uh, uh, building rapport and not creating those spaces for it, which, again, is what I'm taking from your sales training and your teaching people is much more important. The, the rapport building phase is much more important than the, the actual detail of, of the sales conversation. So that's a lot to unpack. Those are yeah. really profound observations, I think. Um, the trick in any human interaction is to make an emotional connection. You bet. I can make an emo I feel like I'm getting to know you, even though we're far from each other, right? We're, we have eye contact. And we can see each other's body language. If you were a prospect, I would be doing exactly what you just said. I would make an emotional connection, not by doing a sales presentation. But, but just ask, finding out more about you. I mean, you're an interest. I looked into your background as well to prepare for this. You're an interesting person with an interesting background. You've done a lot of things in your life. I I already know what I'm saying, right? Or I couldn't say it. Sure. So I'm bored. The more I talk, the more not only are you bored, but I'm bored. I'm not learning anything by talking. Yeah. I'd learn a lot by saying, Steve, tell me how you got started writing books or what do you sure. do? How's it going? And where do you find works? And I mean, we're in the same business. I'd learn a lot from your experience. And I'd be genuinely interested in in knowing more about you. And at the end of a 30 minute Zoom call, I think you would feel like, oh, there's somebody who actually is interested in me as a person. You and bet. that would be true. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it's such an underrated uh, uh, skill set that. The other thing, and this again goes back to training salespeople for oh God, 43 years, is I, I've always been in the mode of everything counts. And um, and looking at, it, it seems like a lot of my peers and associates and people I trained under were all about scripts and what's the script and what's the exact words you're going to use and so forth. But I notice on, on Zoom anymore, I, I've been pitched things where they're in their bedroom and they got a curtain pulling a a clause in the background, the, the 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 backdrop is 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 unprofessional. They showed up late, you know. They're not uh, uh, addressed in a way that I would think the person doing whatever it is I'm I'm talking to them about is uh, is should be doing. Or the and, and I'm guilty of this as well. Sometimes my staff drops the ball on communicating with people ahead of time or or something. But we really make an effort to sequentially remind people, feed them information ahead of time. Uh, make sure that all the details of of the environment is there. You know, on on my end, everything from investing in a halfway decent microphone, as you have, to making sure there's a backdrop that doesn't look unprofessional. Um, you know, mine is a little cluttered and eclectic, but um, and yours is a little cleaner and and uh, arguably more professional looking. But but I think we miss the point that all of those details count in the way that people are evaluating us. The way they're building a a idea of who we are and, and what our company is, what our what our product is, and um, you know what what my annoyance with Zoom recently has been is people using all these virtual backgrounds, and uh, it uh, it seems to me, especially as a financial advisor, and I would say as a lawyer as well, I want to be seen as sincere, honest, um, um, not hiding anything, and then I'll have a conversation with an advisor, and they've got. Uh, you know, the beach video in the background and their, you know, their image is blurring because the green screen thing doesn't work very, very well on Zoom yet. It's getting better. And and it, it um, strikes me as, as um, insincere or at least what are you hiding rather than creating that everything counts um, um, moment where I'm projecting an image that, that is congruent with what I really am and what I want them to see. So I kind of feel like I'm my long lost brother. Um, those are those are all my feelings. Uh, I, very few people share them. But what you're referring to is a lack of authenticity. I mean, we want yeah. to be perceived as authentic, honest, open, and transparent. You bet. So if I, notwithstanding the fact that I'm in Florida, unless I'm really on a beach, to have a beach behind me is in inauthentic. I mean, what you is bet. behind me is real, right? Yeah. 
So there's something, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Very few people are. It's called the McGurk effect. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, it rings the bell in the back of my mind, but I couldn't uh, pull it out immediately. So, if, yeah, if you Google the McGurk effect, with the McGurk effect, it's absolutely fascinating. The YouTube video on it is fascinating. What the McGurk effect says is we are more influenced by what we see than what we hear. And if what we see is inconsistent with what we hear, what we see takes, you know, predominates. So you'll find you'll find that demonstration in the McGurk effect really interesting. So what you just said demonstrates the McGurk effect. If I yeah. show up uh, right after I've worked out in my workout gear and I'm in my bedroom with an unmade bed behind me, it almost doesn't matter what I say because your brain is not going to get over what you're seeing. And what you're seeing is a very unprofessional person. And what I'm saying is hopefully what a professional person says, but that's a battle I'm going to lose because your eyes and your brain predominate. It's a valuable yeah. lesson. I agree with you. There are so many people I see, including advisors I coach, who have a baseball cap turned on backwards, right? Three-day growth men. Women are always always present well, in my experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Always pay attention to detail, very professional. Men are all over the lot. Yeah. So I will often say to them, listen, I don't know who your demographic is, but if your demographic dresses like you're currently dressed, you're fine. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, if they're business people, right? I mean, if they're, you know, lead guitarists in a band, I understand. But you have to know your demographic and you have to dress for your demographic. You bet. You bet. I, the um, um, and, and this is maybe a contradictory principle. One, one, of, the, one of the things I talked about in my book is um, it, it's, it's better to be unique than it is to, you know, kind of blend in with everybody else. Um, a, a, a book that I thought was about 25 percent brilliant, 75 percent silly was uh, Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week. Yeah. And. In that, he talks about the bald fat guy and the you know and the red uh, convertible or uh, BMW or something like that. And I came to think of, of financial advisors as being the guy in the J.C. Penney suit sitting behind his oak desk, you know, bland like everybody else. And I think the 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 professionalism conversation always has to over overlay with the authenticity. And um, um, you know, from your world in the legal world, I, I think of uh, Jerry Spence. Is that I think that's the name. And you know, you'd see the pictures of him with the uh, with the suede coat on and the dangles. And I think he lived in Montana or you know somewhere here north of me. Um, but there there's that balance of create what's uniquely you, authentically, and at the same time prevent a present a professional image that is what they would expect to see, and Something that I would pull out of what you said is it goes back to client targeting, right? It's it, it, it's super important to, to target clients that you're going to resonate with, and to target clients that are are whatever it is the type of people that you're gonna you're gonna fit well with, and and rather than try to say everybody should use my service, say I'm the person for this group of people, and then you can present yourself at that level authentically. You can connect with them. You can understand their language and so forth. Is is that a fair fair statement? Would you agree with that, or would we go a different? Direction? I think uh, I think that's very fair. Uh, Michael Kitsis, as you probably know, is a yeah. big believer in niche marketing, and he would yeah. agree. I I think with saying okay, if it's physicians or dentists, whoever it is, what what I tell people when they ask me how they should present, I, I say I don't really understand why we're making such a big deal here. Um, go to a decent department store for men or women, depending upon who you are, tell them who your demographic is and ask them how to dress yeah. to, to appeal to that demographic. I mean, they should know how to do that. You and in, in Montana, where I think that is where uh, Spence is from, they dress very differently than New York. And when he yeah. tried a case for Imelda Marcos in New York, a uh, jury trial, his opening statement, was, as he conceded, was a complete disaster. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was 
Montana in New York City, and for his he won that trial eventually. But his closing statement was entirely different. He yeah. adjusted to his demographic, and that's what financial advisors have to do. You you're gonna pitch a, a millennial different than you're gonna pitch a senior executive at a Fortune 500 company. So know who your market is, dress for them, but you are you are only going to get one chance to make a first impression i know it's cliche but that's true oh absolutely absolutely it is it, it, it's so important what what are you doing predominantly with advisors now is it predominantly sales training yeah. uh i i know you have a couple of online marketing um ventures that you're doing what what is your primary focus i would say we focus in two primary areas one is coaching advisors in the process that i've developed to help them convert more prospects into clients, dealing with the basic principles set forth in ASK. Mm -hmm. ASK and all my work is premised on a lot of peer review research, which is in like a 30 page bibliography in that book. And so what I tell people is if you're listening to a coach and they're telling you how to convert a prospect into a client, you shouldn't listen to, to my opinion. I'm not a trained psychologist. Uh, but you should look at peer review research. So ask people, so what supports this point of view? I mean, there should be, like there is for investing, there should be some support for it. The second part of what we do, which is playing a very major role these days, is SEO for advisors. We partner with a technical, large technical SEO firm out of Denver, actually, uh, mm -hmm. called Gemsu. And... Uh, we do the content marketing because we do two original blogs a month for every client. And it's the combination of us and them is a powerful combination. So we do a lot of that. We do other stuff, but those are the that's those are the two things that are really take most of our time these days. Okay. In in the in the sales training process, are you are you picking it up from the time they generate a lead or is it mostly the 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 face to face process? How how what are the stages that you want? So I, I have a very bad business model. Um, I, bus I convey a lot in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So in an hour or two, I can pretty much download my process to any any person who's open-minded enough to try it. From there, it can go in one of two directions. They don't need me anymore. I never hear from them. Or they call me and say, I have a big prospect coming in. Let's tailor, I want to go over everything. and I want to tailor it to this prospect. And then after I have the meeting, I want to debrief you. And they become kind of ongoing clients because we tend to revert to the mean with our personal behaviors. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a benchmark. We're accustomed to behaving, interacting in a certain way. Now along comes somebody who says, look, I want you to interact in a completely different way. Well, you're going to do it for a short period of time, but you need you kind of need a constant reminder. So that's how that's pretty much how it works. And I would say it's about 50 50. 50% 50 of my clients, after an hour or two, I never hear from them again. 50%, you know, I'll meet with them three or four times a year every year. Yeah. And, 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 and my argument would be they, they, they really need you forever. Uh, you know, the, 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 the problem that I see so many times is, People are so busy going from guru to guru that they never really fully implement, fully integrate into their systems and then get things into a rhythm. And, you know, over the years, you know, especially on, on the other side of my business with the martial arts schools, I've done a lot of live seminars all over North America. And I would find people showing up every year, at the, you know, every year. And they heard all the same stuff last year. Their numbers have improved 5%, you know, year over year. They really hadn't implemented anything. And they were showing up to be entertained. They weren't showing up to, to make improvement in their business. On the other hand, the ones that would move from there to actually working with me, oftentimes they were doing 100% growth year over year. So, so you know, they go from 16,000 revenue to 85,000 revenue, which would go from a couple thousand net to 50,000 net in 18 months with that constant handholding. And, like like you said, I can great, get great information. I can find having a conversation entertaining. I can get a great outline for things to do. But the day to day implementation is, and I keep finding myself doing that. I mean, I I, you know, I keep finding myself going back to my old Zig Ziglar and Tom Hopkins stuff from forever ago or whatever it might be, 
and reminding myself of things that I already know that I'm not implementing. I went to, uh, you'll appreciate this. I, I was in the franchising realm for a while and I went to a, a, a franchising seminar and my franchising attorney who was, uh, you know, top franchising attorney in the region with Perkins Cooey at the time. And she comes up to me and says, so are you learning a lot of new things? I said, no, but I sure am learning a lot of things that I already know that I'm not doing. <laughs> and, and I, th I think so much of it is that's the most valuable piece of it is, you know, the nudge and the prod and the reminder to implement and change process and to continue to keep that, keep that front of mind. W wouldn't you agree with that? I, I do agree with that. And I confront uh, another formidable obstacle that you may not confront, although I don't know enough about your process. I'd love to learn more about it. Um, the, the neuroscience research I did indicates that we're happiest when we're talking. Mm -hmm. And there's a, it's a chemical reaction. It's like, you know, dropping a, a match into, a, into kerosene. It's going to, you're going to see a lot of fire. So when we're talking, the prefrontal cortex of our brain, uh, oxytocin, dopamine, two feel-good chemicals flood our brain. Like right now I'm talking. When we're listening, if I talk, if I continue talking, the there's a wonderful blog by a woman named Susan Glazer, I believe, who's who's a, was a sales trainer. She uh, sadly passed away, but she was a sales trainer, and she said, when we're talking, yes, we're happy, our brain's on fire, but what about the person we're talking to, or more more likely, more accurately, talking at? What's going on in their brain from a neuroscience point of view is the functional equivalent of being in physical pain. So it's painful for us to sit and listen to people for long periods of time. So my process is premised on not talking, but listening. Mm -hmm. Elicit it's premised on not conveying information, but eliciting information. Well, in order to convince you to elicit information from me and not talk you've got to say to your brain it's okay that i'm not going to be flooded with these happy chemicals because i want to get his business i call it the battle of the agendas mm -hmm. we each have an agenda when i meet you and i don't know you we each have an agenda whatever it is we want to prove that we're smarter better richer more whatever it is right but what if I'm a financial advisor and I don't have an agenda other than I'd love to secure your business. Mm -hmm. That should motivate me to implement my process and just talk and converse with you and learn about you yeah. because I want to be the one that switches those chemicals on in your brain. It's as simple yeah. as that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, 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 that ties so well to, you know, and before I'd ever come across any of the any of the research, and you're saying it much better than than I would have articulated it. But the the number one problem I see with salespeople is they don't have listening skills. Right. And I the the hardest thing I've ever had to t teach somebody how to do is just shut up and listen. And I think it was Steve Covey whose whose comment about most people instead of listening to what the prospect is saying, not listening to what the other person is saying, they're formulating what they're going to say next. And I, I, it, it, it's always been so important to me that I'll, I'll hear these conversations that happen, and even in, in coaching meetings where they're just not listening to what the person is saying, e either listening to the, you know, the NLP people call it the meta, you know, the meta conversation or the, you know, the, the unstated conversation, but they're not hearing what the other person is really saying. Sometimes, you know, what the words are and what the underlying message are, are two very different things. And unless I develop that ability, as you're saying, to not constantly run my mouth and really learn, listen at the deepest level, I don't know where to go from there. Um, I think the one thing I might say is if, if my message with the prospect, if my, my goal with the prospect is to sign their business, maybe my goal with the prospect is to get the best outcome for them. And if that's something that I can help with, I'm in great shape. If it's something I can move them to somebody else. I always look at it that way is my my mission is to figure out what's going to be best for them it figure out if it's in my wheelhouse if i can help them or if i need to move uh somewhere else or refer them to something or help them some some way else and that that's to me the best way to create that level of authenticity is not to be in the what's in it for me mode at, at all 
So I think you said that better than I did. I, I really do agree with that. I think it was Steve Covey, I'm not sure, but the term is, you're looking for is competitive listening. Right. Which means I appear to be listening, I seem to be listening, but I'm really just saying to myself, I hope Steve talks, stops talking so I can now volunteer what's really important in this conversation, right? That's competitive listening. So there are several studies done on this. People confuse hearing with listening. They think mm -hmm. if they're not talking and they can hear what you're saying, they're actually listening. And you stated very well, I think, that's not true at all. Right. And in fact, the survey showed that they, they gave a 10 minute presentation to people. And then they said to them immediately after the presentation, what did you just hear? What did you just learn? Most people could not give a decent summary of what they just heard in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And in, I think it was eight hours later, I think something like 75% couldn't tell you the subject matter of what that presentation was about. So you're absolutely right. Teaching people how to listen, most challenging, it's really most challenging. And the reason is that they can't put aside their agenda. So I'm always saying to them, you can listen, just get rid of your agenda, whether your agenda as phrased by you, which I prefer, is I want to find out what you need so I can just do what's best for you. But on another level, your agenda is people, we hire people we like. We don't necessarily hire the best qualified people. We're not computers, right? We have all kinds of biases. Mm -hmm. So how, the, the question then becomes, how do I become more likable? And the answer to that is you become more likable by empowering people to talk about themselves. And in that process, you're going to learn a lot about what they need, what they want, and you're then going to be in a position to answer their questions. And then at the end of that session, the way I tell people to end the session is to say, how would you like to proceed? And whatever they say is fine with you. I'd like to think about it. But let's have another meeting or sign me up, whatever it is, because you'll then know. Obviously, if you have that interaction and the other person says, I'm interested in day trading and you are a buy and hold index based advisor, you're going to say, I'm not the right fit for you. But in my experience, that almost never happens. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. The 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 other advice I, I've, I've, I've given over the years and a, a lot of the, the staff that, that we would deal with um, on the martial arts side were, were often young. They were, you know, twenties, early early mid twenties, and one thing or another. And but what I would always tell uh, business owners is, I don't hire people who think they're a good salesperson. And my frame of reference for that was folks that I would interview who come in and 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 tell me how great they are in sales are mostly perceive themselves to be really good at talking. Correct. And and I didn't want people who are good at talking. <clears throat> I wanted people who are good, empathetic were really concerned about the other person or really going to be engaged with the other person. Um, the highest performing salesperson I ever had, I fired him on his best month, uh, but it was because of lack of empathy and lack of long-term relationship building skills. He was great at closing the sale. He was bad at maintaining the relationship or even developing the relationship. So now we get into introverts and extroverts, right? Yeah. So the people you're describing tend to be extroverts. They tend yeah. to be people who... They think they're very charismatic. They think that people are attracted to them because of some intangible quality that they have. They think that pretty much everything they're saying is more worthy of being heard than what the other person is saying. These people tend not to be good salespeople um, yeah. because they're really not. The, the line I use is what I want you to be is the most interested person in the room not the most interesting. If you can be the most interested person or the most curious person, that's the metric I'm looking for. And to be interested means you have to ask a lot of questions. And where I, where I have trouble is there are a lot of sales processes that are like a funnel. They tell you what questions to ask to lead to a given destination. I can't find support for this. Mm -hmm. So I say just ask broad, open-ended questions that you would ask, that I would ask you if I met you at a part at a social event. Yeah. What do you do? 
and how long have you done that? What's your background and how do you find that? And, and I, I've often had situations where clients have called me and said, well, I did exactly what you said. We basically talked about nothing for the entire hour. They never asked me any questions. We never talked about what their needs were. I thought it was a really unsuccessful meeting. And I'll say, you have a 99% chance of getting that, that prospect mm -hmm. because the next person they interviewed went to the whiteboard and lectured them for 55 minutes or so, left a couple of minutes for questions, whereas you showed a genuine, genuine interest in hearing what they wanted to say. And I'm almost always right when I make that assessment. Yeah, no, I, 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 was, I was scribbling quickly while you said that. Be the most interested person in the room, not the most interesting. Um, um, be the most curious. I'm stealing that. I, 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 will, I will warn you ahead of time. I'm going to use that about a thousand times in the next Take uh, it. three months. I, I love it. I, I, uh, I make every effort to always give credit to who I stole from, but, uh, but that, I, I, I love that. Uh, it's exactly right is is without that that um, trait of truly being interested in the other person, asking questions about them and deeply listening to the answer is and and, and, and perhaps it may be a more insight than to this than I do. As a financial advisor, you're building a long term relationship with a client. I'm sure there are situations and and the online marketing gurus are, are tend to be in this mode of they're trying to make a quick sale. They're doing a launch, one thing or another. But what we want to be as, as an advisor is we want to be in a relationship with this person for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. We want to build a, a trust position with some uh, good markets, bad markets, crisis, opportunity. We want to, to have that ongoing relationship. And you mentioned Kitsch is one of the, I think I pulled this um, uh, from his material, is the the research was, and I don't have the numbers top of my head, but is, well, and this was actually Northwestern Mutual, some internal research I was uh, uh, allowed to, you know, look at that they did. But it was something like 65% of everybody who has a financial advisor doesn't particularly like whoever they're working with. The, really? number, the number one complaint was lack of communication. And, you know, subset of that was lack of interest in them, um, particularly. Um, and then about 35% at any one time were thinking about leaving the person they had because they were, you know, uh, uh, upset with them. But I thought what was most interesting is they just didn't feel like their advisor listened to them, had much interest in them, communicated effectively with them. And that, that's not, that's not a, a rare situation. That's a vast majority of clients working with advisors who have made the sale. To that person. So I find that very interesting. And it's understandable because when you're in a position where you have asymmetric information, you know more about a given topic than the person in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's a very short intellectual leap to say, well, they must be interested in knowing what I, what I know. That's why they're here. They mm -hmm. came to the expert. I'm the expert. They should sit quietly and make notes while I speak. And that's the mentality, right? The mm -hmm. menta Now, truthfully, most people aren't that interested in, no. in the details of finance and how money is invested and whether factor-based investing trumps market cap investing. I mean, they're not interested in that. They don't read the financial journals, right? They're inter we like people who show an interest in us. And the most ironic thing about this and, and the most gratifying to me is I'm an introvert, right? So I'm not thrilled about meeting like lots of new people. And even meeting one new person can be stressful under certain circumstances. It's really stressful for me if I have to be interesting mm -hmm. because now I have to perform for an extended period of time, which takes a lot of bandwidth. And even if I could do it, I don't think I'm very good at it, but it's very easy for me to be interested. Once I figured this out, all my interactions changed. I mean, it's very interesting for me just to look at you and ask some basic questions. So not only is the process effective, but it's much less stressful than being the brilliant center of attention at all times. You bet, you bet. The the you know when it, when the, where the rubber meets the road on, on on sales training, especially in bigger organizations, is I think I think it, it oftentimes 
trainers start with scripting and with, you know, they, they have this objection. Here's how you answer. Here's, they have this objection. Here's how you answer. Here's the script that you should go through. And I've always objected to that in a couple of ways. Not that, not that having a checklist to go through isn't useful. You've, you, you've gone through a couple already of, 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 of how to be interested in them, asking about background, education, you know, needs, interest, hobbies. You can, you can checklist all of that so that I, I kind of get used to asking those types of questions. But the, the problem with, with the scripting is I think it encourages people to go back to that. You call it competitive talking. Competitive uh, listening. Yeah, competitive listening. Um, 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 the competitive listening mode where they're thinking about what comes next in their script. Um, and the, the handling objections mode, I always think that most objections that I've ever seen in a sales conversation come from a lack of trust. Exactly. Not, not from I truly have something that I want to challenge you on is, exactly. is you've tried to talk me into something and now I'm looking for ways to pick it apart rather than I truly felt like you had my best interest at heart. Is that a fair analysis? or I, I, I think it's very fair. Also, when you are following a script, trying to get to a, 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 a another point, just because we may know more about sales training or finance than the person in front of us doesn't mean they're stupid, right? No. People have a sixth sense when they're being manipulated and particularly they're on high alert when they're being sold. So the problem I have with scripts, with cleverly worded sentences intended to find out what your net worth is and what your experience has been with other brokers and all that, is it assumes that the other person doesn't perceive that they're being manipulated. Yeah. My process doesn't involve any, I don't care where we go. I'm not trying to get anywhere, except I'm trying to get to know you better. But I do want to be, be very clear. My process doesn't compel people to answer questions. There are some people, usually engineers in my experience, that mm -hmm. don't they don't want to answer questions. They don't want chit chat. They want to get down to the brass tacks. So I had a when I implemented my strategy when I was an advisor, I had an engineer and I just said, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. And he said, Listen, Dan, I really don't want to do I don't want to answer mindless questions. I said, Okay, tell me what you would like to talk about. He said, I have 10 questions. I'd like you to answer each of these questions. And that's how I'd like this meeting to go. I said, great. And I was thinking, this is a complete win. I now know what he wants. You I bet. answered all 10 of his questions. I said, how would you like to proceed? He said, how do we get started? There you go. So even my process doesn't involve manipulating people into doing things they don't want to do. It empowers them to talk about themselves if they want to. But you're really just trying to figure out what they do want to talk about. Most people are just trying to figure out, is this a fit? And to figure out if this is a fit, most people, based on all the research I have, I've looked at, will not hire somebody they don't like. That's a big barrier to a sale. Like you could be brilliant, you know, first in your class, know more about investing than anybody, but if I don't like you, I'm not, I'm not going to hire you. And I'll yeah. like. Well, like and trust. Yeah, right. And like means trust, by the way. Yeah, yeah. It's very rare that we like somebody that we don't trust. Yeah. So when we like somebody, when we feel they're interested in us, we kind of trust them. Then we walk out, we call our loved one and say, you know, I met Steve. I really like him. I think he gets us. I think you would like him. And that I, means we're likely to hire Steve because we like him and we trust him. Yeah, I, I I I have a sales story I've told many times, and it's a um, I I was just doing a lot of material on Disney. They they call it good show, bad show. But this was I um, uh, my wife had had a a, a Mercedes E series that had been wrecked, and we were looking for a comparable after it had been totaled. And she had kind of settled on a five series BMW. So we go the uh, the two dealers in town. And the first dealer had this uh, retired uh, uh, Air Force chief who was wonderful. And he whipped out the notebook and he was asking questions, sincerely listening to what she was looking for. Uh, couldn't find it at inventory. 
Uh, anytime something comparable would come in, he was first on the phone uh, to her to see if it was something she was, and he was just wonderful. And then we went to the uh, um, the biggest, newest, uh, most elaborate dealership in town, and all their salespeople were horrible. To the point, which I never do this, I actually had a an hour conversation with her sales manager about how bad their 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 salespeople were. And I I I hate to give free advice, you know. I like people to pay me for it, but but um, um, you know, in the whole process, it was funny. I said, I don't care which one you buy, what it is. I just want you to buy it from the chief over there. You know, he's he's the one. Great story. Yeah, yeah. You like but, you liked him. Yeah. I mean, in my in my experience, I, I've had many experiences like yours. We get a new car like every three or four years. Yeah. And it's mainly for my wife. I'm yeah. a recluse, right? I work out of my office, which is in my home, mm -hmm. and I'm a writer. I don't yeah. really have a need to go anywhere. And since it's Zoom is now, and I don't even go give talks. But rarely do I give talks in person. Mostly yeah. it's webinars. Yeah. So when we go to buy a car, it's for her. Mm -hmm. And I find that the salespeople only talk to me like she's a potted plant. Yeah. And they don't even say to her, are you going to drive the car? I mean, the disconnect is so vast. We've walked out of showrooms. I've, I've had many experiences just like yours. And I've had a few very good ones like you did with the retired Air Force person. I've given talks to dealers, dealerships, and I found that they don't respond very well to my process. I think what it is is they're so ingrained in being dominant in a conversation that they, they view anything else as like a waste of time. They don't understand that the shortest distance between the initiation of contact and a sale is being interested in the other person and shutting up and getting out of the way. You bet. You bet. Yeah. I mean, on the same token, there was a, a Porsche dealership here, Porsche Audi, and um, I, I had bought two 911s from them. You would have thought we would have been on their, on their priority sales list, but I sent yes. her down to go look at an Audi at the same time and they wouldn't give her the time of day. And 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 that that's probably been 20 years ago now and they lost my business ever since. And anytime, anybody, anytime anybody asked them about it, they uh, didn't get a good report because it, it just is that, it, it, as you're saying, the way that they interacted and they, and uh, and by the way, the auto industry sort of has learned its lesson. They, they did all the research and they found that women are about 80% of the buying decision on any car. Uh, you know, GM hired a hotshot marketing female uh, out of California for the Cadillac division when they turned turned it around. Uh, you know, because they 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 missed the point that just like in in both of these cases, you know, the the, the you know in a married couple, the woman's making the decision, the the husband is mostly just the the veto. You know, no, no, I don't like that one. You know, find something else, right? So, I mean, if if my wife does not like a person or a car or a purchase, we're not going to do it. Yeah. Whether it's in my wheelhouse or not in my wheelhouse, I'm not risking my marriage over an item, right? So, if if you had, if they had any common sense, first of all, they'd have more women salespeople in dealerships. It's still relatively rare, you bet. Um, and they would train them to treat women with dignity and respect, which they don't currently do. Yeah, which again is uh, well, the, the top complaint that women have about financial advisors. Yes. Is, is the same the same problem. And and I'd love to have your opinion. It, it, it seems like a lot of the uh, uh, firms that I, that I work with, their thinking is they need to hire women to work with women. And my sense of it is not that they need to hire women to work with women, but they need to teach male financial advisors how to uh, how to communicate empathetically and how to listen and shut up and do exactly what you're talking about is is get to the heart of what the other person's needs and and interests are. And it seems like sometimes their steamrolly pushy way of doing it maybe they get away with it better with men uh, than women. Is 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 that a fair assessment or do you? Well, I I agree. I think it's both actually. Yeah. So here's what the data says on it. The, the data certainly set, supports treating people with empathy, dignity, respect is going to result in more sales. And that for uh, the, in the male female relationship, women are very sensitive to being and appropriately so talked down to, yeah. lectured to, interrupted, all the things that men do all, all too commonly. On the other hand, there's another body of research that says we like to we like to buy from people who are like us. Mm -hmm. 
look like us, talk like us, worship like us, who share our values. So there's some merit to saying everything else being equal. If a large woman prospect is coming in to see one of my clients and they have a choice between putting one of two advisors, a woman and a man, and they're both equally qualified, I would say you'll get a slight edge if you have the woman there. It's not always not always true, but you're absolutely right. I mean, yeah. there there's a real, I, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I, I was a luncheon speaker for a group of women uh, out on the West Coast, actually, about two or three years ago. And I t said, tell me about your experiences interviewing for financial advisors. And one woman said, I interviewed like five financial advisors. They were all men. And I said, what was that experience like? She said, I always felt like they threw up all over me. I'll never forget that rather crude metaphor. But that's what they feel like. They're sitting there listening to people talk about how great they are, what their background is, what their experience is, showing no interest in them. It's sad. It's sad because it's so easy to fix. I mean, yeah. it's a wonderful market because I'd say 98% of advisors have no clue. Yeah, yeah. And the um, um, that visual is, is uh, as somewhat disgusting as it is. I, I've always called it, uh, you know, verbal diarrhea. Just, uh, yeah. you know, just, just this need to pontificate rather than build relationships, listen, have, have empathy. Um, and, and, you know, and buried in that answer was back to the justification for, for niche marketing. I, I've said it many times, you know, I, if I have an advisor who's, who's a Jewish, for instance, well, have, have you worked the synagogue? Have you worked with the other uh, comparables in the area? If you're Protestant, have you worked uh, that angle? If you're, um, um, I have a couple clients who are into fly fishing. You know, use that as a as a as a foot in the door. Another one, um, you know, with Porsche example, he's into uh, collecting Porsche 911 turbos. It's like, well, we should be doing stuff with the dealership. You should be a columnist in the Porsche Club magazine. You should be the speaker for the Porsche Club events. I mean, you know, figure out what the what the um, uh, commonality is in different markets, because again, people buy from people they like and trust. As you said, that's the same thing, and people like to to deal with people who are like them. And so, if if you're a fly fisherman and I'm a fly fisherman, if I grew up in Oklahoma and you grew up in Oklahoma, if you're if you um, uh, are a um, New York City refugee and I'm a New York City refugee, whatever it might be, I mean, that that's kind of the natural way we tend to build rapport anyway, right? Is is Absolutely. asking people questions and finding things that that are commonalities. Yeah, plus specialization is, is appealing. I mean, if, if we have a heart problem, we go to a cardiologist. We don't go to our general uh, internist, right? Yeah. So when people specialize, it, it may not always be true, but it, I think in many cases it is. They have a familiarity with the uniqueness of our particular situation. And in a lot of these niches, there is uniqueness. Like, um, professional athletes have a whole different set of issues than uh, pre-retiree executives, right? Yeah. So they're attracted to firms that deal with other professional athletes. That's why I think niche marketing is very effective. Yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you are also uh, uh, doing some work with um, um, business owners selling their business and facilitating investment beyond that. Did I read that correctly or am I, or am I misreading that? I, I really don't do that, no. Okay, okay. There are firms I'm... that do that, that just specialize in people who are selling their business and how to invest that money and how to exit successfully, but I, that's not something. Okay, okay. I, 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 I misread that. Uh, we haven't talked at all about the, uh, about the digital side. Uh, do you want to spend a couple minutes on, on that, on, on what you do and how, how you and your partner have, have worked on the, uh, the SEO side, I guess? So, you know, what we found was that only 14, uh, this also came from Michael Kitz's article, only 14% of advisors uh, engage in SEO. Either they don't understand it or they perceive it as being too expensive, they don't have the budget for it, or they don't have the patience for it. But the main issue that I get, I hear from advisors, they'd love me to be able to solve is 
it's not necessarily we're not converting enough prospects into clients. It's we don't have enough prospects to convert into, cl into clients. You bet. So how do can you get me more seats in the chair? Yeah. So far, my response is I haven't solved. It's, it's like a Rubik's cube. I haven't solved that problem. The only thing that works, that is proven to work and demonstrably works, is SEO. But SEO requires. For us, $2,000 a month, a commitment, we don't make it a legal commitment, but we tell you not to do it unless you're prepared to stay in for at least a year. Long term, sure. After a year, you should get a positive ROI. Not always, but you should. And then you should start get, seeing a steady stream of qualified leads. Yeah. So the, the problem with financial advisors and SEO is it's a highly regulated industry. So you need the back end all the backlinks and all that technical stuff. That's what Jemsu does for us. Mm -hmm. But you also need original content that has been reverse engineered to feature the keywords that you need to feature in order to ultimately end up on page one of Google. You Once bet. you get to page one of Google, you're in great shape. If it's like financial advisor, who's also a CPA in Denver, you get on yeah. page one of Google, you're going to start seeing leads. Yeah. So yes, we've been very successful with our SEO program for advisors. And I think it's because I totally understand the industry. Jemsu totally understands SEO. We know how to write for that market. Uh, and our, our writing attracts a lot of engagement and engagement leads to backlinks. Backlinks leads to higher rankings and slowly but surely we go from page seven of Google to six to five and then to one. Yeah. 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 Now, now you're getting to my wheelhouse of the 20 things that advisors should be doing to generate new uh, lead volume um, as, as well. But certainly that is, is one of them. And um, um, you mentioned Kitches. He had, I, I forget what it was called, but a, a, a very, very well done article on financial. That may be the report you're referencing where they had done deep dive research on what financial advisors were doing to market, what the cost per client was, and, and so forth. It's one that I have shared many, many, many times. I thought it was extremely well done. Um, it was also shocking in the, uh, um, really, the, you know, the, the, the midpoint in the industry is they don't do much of anything, right? <laughs> and so. Very interesting, yes. He wrote a great article saying SEO is probably the most cost-effective marketing you can do. Yeah. And he was saying, I don't understand why more advisors don't do it. But what I think he may not understand is that, uh, you, is your point, most advisors barely have a marketing budget. And while yeah. they, uh, the anomaly is, if you're a financial advisor, you're an expert in risk, right? You're dealing with risk with your clients. You're measuring risk. You're telling your clients how much risk they can take. And we know that there's a relationship between risk and expected returns. But it goes in two directions. I mean, there's also a relationship between risk and losses. In their own business, they have no understanding of risk whatsoever. Any risk is too much risk. So they don't invest in themselves. So instead of spending 5 to 7% of their gross revenues on marketing, they're spending 1% to 2%, if that, mm -hmm. because they feel it's too much risk. That is an anomaly. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and um, um, and I, I could put it in different phrases. They they don't understand return on investment, which is interesting. You know, you would you would you would think it'd be a way that they'd be thinking about. Yes, it. Yes, you would. But but I rarely talk to a, a, an advisor who understands the lifetime value of their average client, how much uh, revenue is likely in the first year of the relationship, how much of that would be reasonable. Again, use the the you know uh, um, seven to ten percent number. If if I have a client who brings me a million dollars and I keep them for 20 years, what's the lifetime value of that? What's the first year value of that? Should I should I be willing to spend 100 percent of what, you know, the initial revenue is uh, to get that client knowing what the back end is? They they, they don't have the ability to think that way. Uh, and I, when I say ability, I guess it, it, it is such a manual labor sales intensive industry where you know, at at one end, it's begging my clients for who they know, and on the other side, it's maybe doing you know, uh, dinner meetings. Um, that going through those numbers and really understanding that I think is foreign to them. 
And then when you get to something like SEO, I mean, picture that number, $24,000 in a year. Well, if it produced one highly exactly. qualified client, You've I've made got your money. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in good shape, right? If you have a very, you have a very high return on investment at 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 a million dollars and say say seventy basis points is seven thousand dollars. Yeah, where you're going to keep that client for anywhere from five to twenty years, and that's just one client. So yeah, it it makes a it makes a lot of sense. They have the ability, obviously, to do it, but they don't have the inclination to do it. Yeah, and I, a lot of it is, I think, in their defense. There are, and you probably know this a lot better than I do. There are a lot of pretty shady schemes out there sure. for pitching advisors on how to generate leads. Usually, they relate to like social media scraping and then pitching mm -hmm. contacts. So they've been burned a number of times, and they're skeptical. Yeah. But I or, think they or, should or look buying at the, the same lead that five other advisors bought, and <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. Any yeah. of these lead buying schemes, I mean, I, I I have trouble when whenever I have a large, pretty large following on LinkedIn, and whenever I see this pitched in my thread, I say, look, I have really good news for you. I can't replicate these results. Hmm. If I could, I would offer it to my clients. Give me ten clients who have done your plan. And have a positive ROI, and I will send business to you because I can't do it. Nobody ever responds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, uh, not a healthy way to go about business. Certainly, bad positioning in the advisor's standpoint. You know, it's, yeah. As, as you know, knew when you were litigating, you want to be perceived as the uh, the one that people are uh, are desperate to get, not the one who's who's out there begging for their business. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Just pitching business in that environment erodes your credibility and is another major barrier to overcome when you finally meet the meet the advisor, I think, right? And yeah. there are no, just generally, like, there are a lot of analogies to investing. We know that good investing requires time, patience, lack of emotion, right? There are no quick, rich, get get rich quick schemes Advisors advise against, appropriately advise against this. It's the same with marketing. You bet. If there was some easy scheme, you and I would be selling it, right? I'd write a, we'd write books about it and say, yeah. do this. It costs $5,000. You'll get millions of dollars of business. It doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. Well, my, my go-to, and that's why I have the Wall Street uh, uh, facade in the background there, is build a Parthenon, have, you know, have 20 different feeders going on at any one time, SEO and and uh, live outbound and um, uh, uh, referral events. I mean, you can go through the list. Um, hey, Dan, I, I want to be respectful of your time. We've got a little over our uh, our expected time, but I could talk to you for uh, for, you know, 16 hours on these subjects. You're certainly hitting some of my favorites. Um, again, your book is Ask How to Relate to Anyone. Uh, what's the newest book? The newest book is called Wealthier, The Investing Field Guide for Millennials. I wrote it for millennials. I didn't write, I, I, I'm fond of saying this, I don't write for fame or fortune. I really write to impact people in a positive way. Yeah. So millennials don't have enough money to be, most, many of them, to be of interest to advisors. So I, want, I was getting a lot of requests that were like this. I'm just starting, I'm out of college. How do I start investing? What do I invest in? And what's a good path for me to be on? So I wrote a book for those people to say, okay, this is the path. Start on this path. Ultimately, you're going to need an advisor. When you do, here's what you should be looking for. Fortunately, there are plenty of very good advisors out there that will definitely add value. And so I wrote it in English, and then I wrote a Spanish language version called Ma I don't speak Spanish, so don't belittle my accent, but mm -hmm. Mas Rico, which is wealthier in Spanish, because I wanted to appeal to Spanish speaking Americans. And then I'm partnering with a very large multi-billion dollar firm in Canada, PWL Capital. We're coming out with uh, a similar book called Wealthier, uh, the Investing Field Guide for Canadian Millennials. We've Canadianized that book and that's gonna come out sometime this fall. Excellent. And if somebody wanted to connect with you for um, um, digital or for sales training or for any, Anything else? What would be the best route to? Uh, they could uh, go to my website, www.danielsolon.com. 
They could use my personal email, which is easier to say than my business one, dansolon at yahoo.com. Excellent. And, and uh, I had uh, been um, tracking you down with askdansolon.com, which was the, the, the website for the Ask book as well. Yes, the website for the Ask book is askdansolon.com. Thanks for reminding me for the new book. It's wealthierbook.com. Excellent. And my contact information is all over there. By the way, before we end, it was really a pleasure talking to you. I, I very much enjoyed this podcast. So thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, Dan, I, I very much want to do it again. I'd, I'd, I'd love to, uh, you know, parse these out into a couple of topics that are right down your wheelhouse. Right. Um, you know, as, as, as you said, I feel like we're brothers from a different mother or whatever. The, uh, uh, you know, your approach said in a, in, in a, uh, a little bit more uh, articulate way is exactly what I've been training on and teaching people. Uh, on sales forever, even the introvert extrovert uh, uh, distinction. Um, you know, I uh, going back to the Myers Briggs. I'm an INTJ. Always, always have uh, uh, perceived that the introverts who wanted to listen were better than the extroverts who wanted to talk from a sales perspective by far. Yeah, no, I, I agree. When I when I'm doing coaching, when I meet somebody, what I'm I can tell right away whether somebody's an introvert or an extrovert. I mean, with with reasonable precision, I've made mistakes, uh, but I'm always thinking, oh, you're an introvert. This is going to go really well. Yeah. If it's an extrovert, I've got a lot of untrained. I've got a lot of retraining to do. This could be this could be difficult. Yeah, I've always said I'm a situational extrovert. Cause I've done tons and tons of teaching, public speaking, you know, sta big stage, small stage. But but then it's go, you know, go to the beach with a book and, and get away from people to recover. You're an introvert. You're on the introverted on the introverted scale. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, I very much appreciate it. We'll make sure we have all your contact information and in all the notes here. But uh, again, the, the main website was danielsolon.com. Yes. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Steve. The recording has stopped.